lecture, spring semester. Before we introduce our guest, this afternoon, Michael Lindbergh, I uh, just wanted to remind you a couple of things. We have a reception following the lecture, followed by a book signing. So he will be talking in French both. Now, the French style will be introduced to the Michael Lindbergh. Hello. Thank you so much. Uh, well, uh, and I'd like to welcome Michael Limbaugh. Actually, I have to tell you, the first time I came across Michael Limbaugh was in 1999, I think. 1999, last yeah, it was in the 90s, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> last century. Uh, I saw this uh, incredible <laughs> exhibition in Rome. I was in Rome, and there was this exhibition on sacred architecture, and they were organized by uh, an Italian architect, uh, Mr. Rosponi, and also our very dear uh, Professor Duncan Stroik was involved. And there was this kind of incredible uh, show of uh, project of sacred architecture, contemporary, which were kind of really continuing a tradition of good sacred building, uh, kind of sometimes at the edge of the modern movement, but very, very kind of intriguing, very encouraging. There was actually a project by Michael Limbaugh, which I really loved, and I said, who is this guy? I wanted to know him. <laughs> And then I get in touch with you. I don't know how uh, there was. Uh, we were not Facebook friends at that time. Your your web your webzine. So and I really followed. I followed Michael uh, Michael Swigger and I was always intrigued. And uh, and I think it took it, it took you a while to do put out this really beautiful book last year or was that last year? Your no, last year. This book uh, uh, published by Rizzoli is really really beautiful. Now, something I, I think very extraordinary about Michael, there are many things which are extraordinary, <laughs> but uh, I think one, one thing I really love is you kind of, the way you learned about architecture, this idea of apprenticeship, and then also this idea of being kind of born into a place, into a community, so Texas, and I was just, we were just talking before, I'm from Luxembourg, and you know, I, when I was a kid, you know, we saw Texas was America, you know, there was no difference. So <laughs> for me, that Texas really was already very exciting. Uh, and then also, I, I saw in your book, there, there are pictures of your dad, that you had know, experience with your family. So this kind of layering of family, biography, the territory, and the universality of apprenticeship. So learning, even building on the oil field and building kind of metallic structures for, for to protect machines or to protect the, the, the rigs mm -hmm. and, and so on. And so I'm kind of really learning, uh, you know, as an apprentice, how to put things together, then working with the great masters of classical architecture, but also of the modern, of these kind of still very good older modern architects who were kind of working within a regional perspective. So a type of critical regionalism, which was mm -hmm. very present all over, all over the United States. Uh, so, and another intriguing thing I found was this idea that you started a project with painting. And I think it's something where we have a, there's a resonance, you know, we kind of really like looking, and then also the landscape. So going, looking at the site, painting the site, exploring graphically the kind of environment, looking at places, villages, ruins, and getting a really feeling for the place, for the community. Which leads me to say that, you know, I think that Michael is doing an architecture of place, but also an architecture of feeling. You know, an architecture where, you know, the, the sentiment, the emotions are not excluded, and that, that where at some point, at, in, you, in your education, I think there's a point where reason, rationality, and feeling come together, and you get, in, you get immersed in, in the great classical masters, and I think that's where really the maturity of your work comes across. Now you were talking a lot about rugged, raw, uh, authentic. So I think that's another really interesting. Uh, so this kind of interest in the vernacular, in the in the real immediate, in the kind of local. But then when you translate it, it gets very refined. So it's not just a kind of folkloristic replica of a of a kind of vernacular history, but it's a very intelligent, intellectual, and artistical processing of a culture into something which Goethe would call an eternal newness. So a newness which is kind of always perpetual, which ties into the past, but which also kind of really brings refreshed information, refreshed feeling, and then which also ties us to the modern, to the contemporary. 
Now, uh, uh, Michael uh, writes, uh, and you know, I, I have some notes here. That, you know, I mean, okay. You are right also about nostalgia and kind of really speaking about nostalgia about something kind of positive. And again, I, I like to quote, uh, I mean, I speak part of uh, Goethe, who says that nostalgia has to kind of be uh, creative of a, of a perpetual union, so what I mentioned before. And then I like also to quote Heidegger, you know, uh, I like to quote him, <laughs> like, you know, uh, uh, talking about origin, because you kind of relate to origin to the place. And then Heidegger talks uh, about <coughs> origin here means that from and by which something is what it is and as it is. What something is, as it is, we call its essence or nature. So and I think that's very important. So kind of going back to the origin of things and becoming really original because you kind of tie it to the essence of a place and to community. Now, uh, a quote by Michael, and then I go to your biography. Uh, that's uh, what I wanted my architecture to be an anonymous gift to our built environment. Now, that's a quote by Michael, but now you will see that it's very difficult to be anonymous anymore. Lecturing here, and then now I'm reading your biography, I don't know how you succeed in, in being anonymous. If you <laughs> can tell me afterwards, I will forward it to other people. So, Michael Limba, uh, FAIA, is the principal architect of Michael Imba, uh, Michael G. Imba Architects. LLC, a modern classical design firm based in San Antonio, Texas, and recognized for a body of work that is strong in historical sentiment, <coughs> yet more, more than in its execution. Michael has been honored with numerous local and national design awards, including the Texas Society of Architects William W. Cordill FAIA Award for his achievements as a young architect and for his contributions to the American Institute of Architects. In 2007, Michael was honored with the Arthur Ross Award for his enduring commitment to the classical tradition in residential architecture, civic building, and neighborhood design. In 2008, he was inducted into the American Institute of Architects College of Fellows for his contributions to American design. Most recently, he has been the winner of the 2010, 2011, and 2013 Palladio Award for outstanding achievement in traditional design and numerous Texas Institute of Classical Architecture and Classical America Stout Awards in 2011 and 2012, and is the designer of the 2011 Southern Living Idea House. Michael is widely known for his idyllic ranch and country houses throughout Texas and the Western United States, as for his coastal residences and luxury resorts around the world, receiving much recognition for their sensitivity to landscape, material, craft, and culture. He was named Master of the House by Southern Excellence Magazine and was the designer of the 2009 Idea House in Galveston, Texas for Coastal Living Magazine as well as the 2011 Idea House for Southern Living Magazine. Michael is an NCRARB registered architect and licensed in the state of Texas, Colorado, Florida, California, Mississippi, Maine, New Mexico, and Utah. Not Indiana yet. <laughs> he is a founding <laughs> council of the Congress of Presidential Architects and the founding president of the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art, Texas chapter. His work has been featured in many local and national publications, such as Coast of Living, New Old House, Texas Architects, Western Materials, Southern Accents, and Paper Film. His most recent publication by also Elizabeth Dowling and Fitzroy Press have a new monograph of his work, which you can see and buy later. And I'm very pleased to welcome the best known anonymous architect in Texas. <laughs> Thank you, Lucien. You know, I, that was a really insightful um, introduction. I, I should have had you written the forward of my book for me. So. Uh, <laughs> next one. So, you know, what Lucien was, was talking about in terms of our, our connection to the landscape and our connection to the place is really at the root of, of what we do. Uh, you know, a lot of architects that, that are probably before you are, are those who work in very urban conditions. Uh, we're just the opposite. Most of our projects and are 
uh, in very rural conditions, uh, in places where there's, there's not a lot of built environment that can you know, begin to inform us as to uh, what our architecture should be uh, contextually. So we, we look to the landscape uh, and we look to you know, who we are as a people. So you know, for us, you know, it all begins here. Um, you know, as young children, we're all wide-eyed and, and bushy-tailed and, and you know, we have this we're born into this world of chaos where you know, it's sensory overload and we're constantly seeking that which is new. Uh, after a while, you know, we are, we're like this, like your computer's hard drive. We begin to, all the books that we've read, all the movies we've seen, all the people we've met, all the professors who have taught us, uh, begin to gather on us and, until we eventually become something like this. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, still young at heart, but uh, a, a, little, a, a little more a moss gathered on us. Uh, but you know, as, as architects, you know, we really you know, are unique in that we all really remain seekers. Uh, we're always looking, we're always trying to see uh, that which is around us uh, that can inform us to be better architects. Um, so you know, with me, that, that started my childhood in West Texas. Um, and you know, a lot of people say, well, it's not the landscape that inspired you. So, but you know, there was something about growing up in a place of isolation. Uh, you know, growing up as a child, you know, I, I didn't have Xbox, I didn't have cable. You know, we, yes, we had TV. Okay. But um, you know, there, we were left to our imagination. You know, I had a room where you know, I was surrounded by these wonderful paintings, these capriccios that my aunt had done of these far fantastical places. And as a young child, I, I didn't know if this was real or, or fantasy or, or, or what, but they really you know, drove my imagination. Uh, you know, drawings and, and paintings of far off places and, and voyages uh, really inspired a young child that was stuck out in the middle of the desert. Um, so you know, we also had this amazing journal that laid on our coffee table that you know, as a young child, I didn't realize its relevance to me you know, later on as an architect. But a book on Buck Schweitz, which was you know, the importance to my parents were that you know, it was the travel journal for Humble Oil Company uh, that showed these wonderful drawings of these places around Texas that you should get in your station wagon and visit one day. Uh, but to me, you know, all of these places represented Texas as I saw it. Uh, this was when Texas was authentic. Uh, this was Texas, you know, before the Quickie Mart was set on the corner with these bright mercury vapor lights. Uh, you know, these, these were the places where you set memories of, of walking down uh, a shell road or, or hearing the squeak of grandma's door. Uh, these are the places that, that set memories uh, of my childhood. Um, and this is the way I saw Texas. This, is, this was West Texas. This, this is a painting by Dennis Blagg, a contemporary painter. Um, it did these, these wonderful um, uh, panoramic views of what West Texas feels like and the vastness of the landscape. But you know, one thing he notes in, in his book is that uh, one of the things he tries to capture uh, uh, are things such as the, the Indian legend where uh, the great creator gathered up all the refuse from the creation of the world and threw it in West Texas. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but it created this wonderful drama uh, that you had in no other place. And so this, is, this was the Texas of my childhood. We'd, we'd pile in the station wagon and you know, we'd head down this highway west. And we'd end up at these wonderful places like Mesa Verde, uh, these places that have been there for centuries, you know, carved out of the very rock in which they were built. Um, the inhabitants long gone, uh, but their memory is still there in place. And, and we'd see these, these fabulous structures throughout the West uh, that uh, you know, felt as though they, that they had been there forever. But you know, later, as an architect, I found that these hadn't been there forever. A structure like this was designed by Mary Coulter um, uh, in the 20th century. Another one of Mary's uh, structures in Grand Canyon. And the reason why 
these buildings connected to the landscape and the spirit and the materi materiality of the place. Uh, it, it, it created something that was more authentic because they embodied the spirit of where they were. So this is the Ember Brigade on the cannons at Fort Davis. Uh, this was about one of the closest places to where I grew up, about two hours away by car. Uh, but this wonderful fort, Victorian fort in the mountains of West Texas. Um, and so I got to experience these places and explore them. Uh, you know, there was the soundtrack of a bugle going off when you roam the grounds here. But it was also this idea of what it used to be. Again, another book that my parents had, filled with these wonderful paintings of the old Texas forts uh, back when they were, you know, were functioning. And so there was this lack of division for me between truth and lore. Um, and so for a child, that was a wonderful thing, that, that you know, there was a blurred line uh, between who we were and who we thought we were. Uh, and sometimes that even went back uh, to prehistory, you know, beyond that which was written, uh, but the people who occupied the land long before. Uh, here is Fort Sam, which isn't far from where I live today in, in San Antonio. Uh, and this is where, you know, my kids grew up, you know, going for picnics in the very quadrangle uh, where Geronimo uh, was uh, held captive. Um, so, you know, San Antonio is a wonderful historic city, but what most um, of San Antonio's history, uh, it's, it's not in pictures, it's not in photographs, it's, it's embodied in the culture, uh, in this memory of who we are as a people. Uh, so it's a reflection of a community and a place. It's a reflection of our own understanding of this is who we are. It's our history, our traditions, our music, our food, our celebrations, our lifestyles, and our buildings. So our buildings should say, this is our past, our traditions, our environment, our resources. This is who we are, and this is how we build. So Lucien mentioned that you know, I uh, involve painting a lot in our practice. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the meaning of painting to culture and to uh, we as architects. So here we're looking at a 15th century Botticelli as uh, an idea of a palimpsest. That is, you know, the old Roman texts that were you know, housed in monasteries where you know, the paper or the, the lambskin was so valuable that the old text would be rubbed off and new text would be written over. And as times changed, that text would be rubbed off and written over. But over time, you could always read beyond the old text to, to beyond the new text to the old text. And so there, there were these layers of meaning written time over time. And so in America, we had our own palimpsest, written and rewritten histories of who we were and who we wished to be. Here we have Thomas Coles and the heroic landscape, all of human history painting in the course of an empire. The Hudson River School, the first contemplation of, of the American domain philosophically as settlers spread out across the continent, where human beings and nature coexist, where poetic and artistic inspiration found no impediments, abandoning rationalism for emotions and feeling. Here's Frederick Church, landscapes that rise like great cathedrals into the realms of light where the deity seems to reside, primordial images of the American wilderness. Here you have Thomas Cole, the idea of relationship between humanity and all-powerful nature. Nature is God's refuge to the poet hero and the idea that by observing, by seeing, one will know God and one will know truth. Albert Bernstadt, America was a vast and full possibility and this new view of ourselves shaped a nation. Brotherhood, humanity, and ecology. These painters represented manifest destiny. Natural majesty during a time of American expansionism, searching for a balance between human expansion and the preservation of nature. You can just hear Aaron Copeland looking at this painting. 
But as American expansionism spread, so did these artists' reaction to industrialization, pollution, and attitudes toward Native Americans. They became our first environmentalists. We have a Thomas Moran and his manifestation of God in nature, his painting of Yellowstone that so touched the American spirit that it became our first national park. So here I come back to our time and a painting again by Dennis Blagg. And you know, this painting, when I look at this painting, I can smell the ozone. I can feel the cool wind rushing down the mountain. I can hear the crack of thunder, the crunch of gravel under my feet. It's a, it's, as, as a painting, it's not just a snapshot of a place, but reaches far deeper into our sensory memories. John Ruskin described this art as measuring the moods of nature. There's another contemporary painter in Maine, Tom Curry, as, with an island as an object, as reflections of our environment and our emotions, shaping our feelings of a place and our memories of a place and of a time. We had artists like George O'Keefe here in New York as a hard scrabble painter, and then taking that talent to the Southwest, where she expressed human emotion, where she expressed the human emotion of her environment. We had artists like Edward Hopper. Seeing the, seeing the landscape not as a collection of objects, but of color. Hopper's aesthetic strategies as synesthesia or cross-century imagery. Walter Wells says, artists have the power to make us taste what we see or hear what we feel, to give odorful color, melodious flavor, or a chill wind perceived as a wailing siren or a quivering blue light. <coughs> what Hopper could do like no other artist was to capture the silence and loneliness of a place. Historically, there have always been artists who influenced architects. Here we have David Roberts, who brought architecture into the context of place and history in his paintings of the Holy Land. Delacroix, his architecture and landscape as a setting for cultural history. Here we have his sketchbook, the landscape, architecture, and culture were inseparable. Artists like Delacroix inspiring ar uh, architects such as Charles Edward Genere. Then there were the Americans in Florence, what they called the Boston of Italy, promoting the education of Yankee taste, where Edith Wharton with Maxfield, Maxfield Parish, uh, with his illustrations of her Italian villas and their gardens. You could just feel the golden sunlight on the cypresses. And among them, you had John Singer Sargent with his friend, John Lafarge, who learned to paint under William Morris Hunt. The studies of the architecture of Italy and the study of the light and luminosity of materials. You had Winslow Homer, where painting was not the answer, but the site of constant and obsessive search. He would often rush friends out onto a rocky shore during a storm and have them see for themselves the true force of nature. He and friends like John Calvin Stevens, architect in Maine, would go painting. Uh, Stevens helped him design his own home and studio where he would observe the interactions between land, sea, and sky. And we had John Ruskin, the English art critic and social thinker, who was among the first to anticipate the environmental movement, sustainability, and resurgence of craft. To draw is to gain an empirical knowledge, an understanding through experiencing. To draw the leaf is to know the forest. We, of course, had the training of the architects in both their informal and both the formal education, such as the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, and their studies of field. The sketchbook by Stanford White, with his grand tour with his friend Augusta St. Gaudens. The seeing the understanding, and the knowing. It was expected of every architect. Again, here we have Charles Edward Genere, or otherwise known as Le Cabousier. 
And then there are those Americans at the American Academy in Rome, and among them, landscape architects. We had Shepherd and Jellico from England on their own journeys. So we have Villa Gambriella. Or Charles Platt at the Academy Julian in Paris. We had journals such as the Boston Architectural Club encouraging the documentation of travel abroad, where members would bring back their studies and learning of language of a place. Pencil Points was the journal of the drafting room, where drawing was the nucleus of a practice. It's a drawings of author Guptal. And Samuel Chamberlain doing studies of the American life and the way we live. So they understood the very essence of our own communities. In California, we had architects like Willis Polk. And then there was Bertram Goodhue, influenced from his travels to Mexico as a young man in his early 20s. In his book, Sojourns to Mexico, he drew and wrote about the colonial architecture of Texas, I mean, of, of Mexico. Um, and of course, as a young man on spring break in Mexico, he had a full chapter on the Senoritas. <laughs> uh, obviously, obvious influences of his work were at the Pan American Exhibition in 1915, where it was introduced the concept of regionalism and understanding who we were locally, not just as one nation. We have Santa Barbara, as it was imagined after the earthquake, places that we think that we understand as some of the most authentic cities in the nation, built new. The buildings by Lionel Price, contributing to Santa Barbara's new fabric. But Price didn't just invent this architecture, it was an architecture that was influenced deeply through his experiences in travel and his art. These are his travels in Guanajuato, Mexico, as well as his influences by Georgie O'Keeffe. So bringing it today in our own travels, um, this is a, a, a picture of Stephen Harvey, if, if some of y'all know him. Uh, Stephen's quite a character. Uh, uh, Stephen does these wonderful travel watercolors, um, you know, much in the vein of John Singer Sargent. Uh, we ran into, this was actually um, just before uh, Stephen dropped us off at the, at the dock in Venice um, and running into a uh, gondola pole and knocking over a 600-year-old pole into the water. We all leapt to our, our uh, retreat and let Stephen handle the mess behind him. Um, but here are some of my studies you know, from that trip with Stephen. Villa Capra. And so this idea that to take a photo is merely a transference of data, capture versus response. To draw it is to absorb it into my memory and to make it a part of who I am as a person and as an architect. So as I go out into the landscapes in which we build, it's a way for me to understand and know a place. whether it's just a sunset and the way the light hits the hills in West Texas, or it's the drama of the Rio Grande um, gorging a canyon through the plain. From the coast, this is California, to Maine, or abroad, this is the Amalfi Coast in Italy, capturing the layer of history in the landscape. Quick sketch in the Bahamas or in Antigua, Guatemala. And you know, I want to point out, you know, these, are, these all aren't marvelous sketches. These are just ways for me to record what a place means to me. You know, when I look at the sketch, I don't see a, a good drawing. I feel how cold and numb my fingers were at 3 o'clock in the morning because I couldn't sleep because I just landed in Florence. So pages out of sketchbooks or more studied watercolors. Um, remembering a snow in Parc Monceau, Place de Vosges, or preparing ourselves for a project in Spain. Uh, I had arrived late one afternoon 
uh, to work with uh, Andreas Duani and his team. And so the first thing I did was go and sit out on the patio and begin watercoloring to understand and get a feeling of the place. And then this was the block of the village we designed later that week. The places in Scotland or in Mecca, Saudi Arabia. A project in the Bahamas. Uh, this is in preparation for a project we have in construction in Long Island, Bahamas. Uh, a simple church washed by the sun and then a quick concept study of the actual project. Or in Telluride, understanding the view that we're trying to capture and then a quick concept sketch of the house. A current project in St. Kitts in the West Indies and a current project not far from San Antonio, uh, west of San Antonio. And again, sometimes these are out sitting on the site. Uh, sometimes, uh, such as in this, it's posting together or pasting together photographs. Uh, I was in my client's helicopter uh, taking photographs out of the canopy. And when I got back, pasted it together and created a drawing and painted it. But if I hadn't have done that, there's no way I could have recognized the the uh, paths of the game as they migrate through the, um, through the property or the way the subtle change and leaf canopy changes as the river runs through the, can through the, um, through the property. You know, all the subtleties that as you're painting it, you realize and you're seeing for the first time as opposed to simply snapping a, a photograph. This is the concept for this, the, the ranch soon to get under construction. And then here's a project. Uh, this was a, um, um, a Palladio Award winner. This, is, this started out with un trying to understand the landscape. Some quick sketches, a little more studied sketch. And then a sketch really studying the side of the house itself. Uh, this is Rough Canyon, uh, which was going to be uh, viewed by the back of the house. Um, so I really wanted to get a feeling for the actual hillside uh, and an understanding for the situation of the house itself. And then the concept for the house as it was conceptualized and then built. Yet here we're using uh, cypress sucker rods from a water well to create the grills on the windows and the, the subtle modeling of the plaster to catch light. Um, working with craftsmen to carve the beams and the vigas and to create plaster niches. And working with iron smiths to design the hardware for the antique Spanish doors the client contributed to the project. interior space. And the way the light paints the plaster as it comes through the windows. Uh, this is another Palladio award winning project, a project in Bandera not far from uh, our office uh, along the Medina River, which was uh, where they manufactured cypress cedars in the 1850s. Uh, it had special meaning for me because my father, um, when he was a young man, uh, was a dude on a, or a cowboy on a dude ranch and uh, used to have all these wonderful stories of this place. Uh, but it still remains a place of real character today. Uh, here you see the modern cowboy right next to the, the traditional cowboy. Um, his girlfriend better watch out getting out of the car. Uh, <laughs> um, but here was our site. There was an existing house uh, done by uh, a renowned mason in the 1920s. Uh, the original architecture was designed by the daughter working with the San Antonio architect. The daughter was rumored to be a stage set designer in um, New York. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, Texas home with lots of character uh, and just really s spoke to this client. This was actually uh, a house done for one of the Dixie Chicks. Um, but it, it had 
seen um, a, a lot of abuse over the years. Uh, people trying to add mechanical systems and not doing it appropriately. Um, and just kind of patching things together over time. Um, the house had a lot of character, but it was fairly simple. Uh, and we were asked to really double it in size. And so our challenge was, how do we double this, this house without destroying the charming character that drew us all to it? So this was the house under construction. And this was the house as it was realized. Harvesting a lot of the materials from the very side on which we built all of these cedar logs. And the river from the very, on oh, the rock from the very river that we were building next to. Here we have, this is one piece of the existing house and an existing wisteria arbor and how we created the new house to come up against it. And then, you know, covered mechanical systems in a way that it blended everything together in unity. Interior space. Here we have an existing wall and then a new wall as it comes in. And then custom designing all the light fixtures to fit the space, as well as all the mechanical grills. So they, they had the same character as the rest of the house. The new breakfast room, the new living room, the cypress logs that were hewn in the town next door, the fireplace out of the river stone. And so you have these craftsmen that work on these projects. And these are something that, that are really special to me, with it, given the life of these projects. It's not something that they come to work and they walk away and you have a railing. Um, you know, they go home at night and they dream about their work. They wake up in the morning excited about what they're going to create. And they come and they do their work. And in the end, they don't just leave the owner with something special, but they leave the house with something special for generations. They leave a part of themselves with the architecture. It's another uh, project in far west Texas. Uh, this one was, was fun. It was never realized, but uh, he wanted a tower so he could go up and watch these, these blue northers, these severe storms, come across the northern plains. Uh, but he was a bit of a chicken, so he wanted a, a storm cellar that he could run down into. Um, <laughs> but this was the brilliance of the scheme. The storm cellar seconded as a wine cellar. So he could stay down there as long as he wanted. So the study of the tower. And then, you know, this was a project that was very much uh, influenced by uh, the drawings of Shepard Angelica, a house in, in Austin, Texas. It's a hacienda in South Texas, uh, a new hacienda in, in South Texas. Uh, one I was telling Lucien was inspired by Villa Madama. This was the first scheme, quite grand and then the value engineered scheme. <laughs> uh, a house in Ojai, California, and a house in Texas, similar cultural influences. A house in West Texas, a straw bale house in West Texas. One of our earlier projects where the plan really does begin to even reflect the cultural underpinnings of the site, uh, being in what was once known as the Dead Horse Desert. Uh, we arranged the plan first based on the laws of the West Indies, but also with this idea of the wagon train kind of circling for security against the wilderness. And this was the house sitting in the landscape. And then once you're inside the walls. A sketch for a house in San Antonio. And then the realized house. And then we've also been involved uh, with some of, uh, I saw Douglas here today, we've been involved with some of DPZ's work. Uh, this was one where uh, DPZ was responsible for getting 300 designers together for a charrette, planting charrette in Mississippi after Hurricane Katrina. Um, here we see how devastated uh, the coast was. But what was surprising, what we thought was, was total annihilation by the storm. Uh, was interesting to find that older architecture uh, really resisted the forces of nature. 
Uh, it was built to resist the forces of nature. Uh, the, the projects or the houses that were completely gone were those built in the 60s, 70s, and 80s uh, because their codes were national. They ignored completely this idea of building in an environment that had special circumstances. This is one of the watercolors of the vision of the new port, the Gulf port. So you know, we had our own disaster in Texas at one time. This was the storm of 1900 uh, that almost completely wiped out the city of Galveston. 3,600 buildings were destroyed by a 16-foot tidal surge. 6,000 people were killed. It was the country's worst national disaster. But we're still left with a few of the beautiful homes and the fabric of what Galveston used to be. And so we were asked to help with the architecture of a new DPZ community right on the beach in Galveston, dealing with some of those same um, forces that we had dealt with with Katrina and what Galveston had dealt with in the storm of 1900. So here is some of the studies, or some of the studies for um, the architectural vocabulary for the community. Here we have a coastal vernacular, a southern ca classical, classical, and here's a house uh, based off the lighthouse of Socrates, and Carpenter Gothic. Uh, the first house we built was Carpenter Gothic. Again, all of these houses, you know, being a vernacular interpretation within a certain language that was consistent with the city itself. So the first thing that was important was that we build sustainably in this environment. So we let in natural light, so there was minimal use of lighting during daylight hours. We had natural ventilation, so that you could open doors and ventilate the house without conditioning. And we raised the house so that in the case of a storm surge, there was minimal damage. We built with modern construction materials, mold resistant woods and concrete to make sure that the underpinnings of the house were secure. And the unique thing about this project is that as a coastal living project, we had to do everything here in nine months from the beginning of design when we first knew our site to when they moved the furniture in the house. So it's an extreme and fast process. And we accomplished that, getting everything done and celebrated. <laughs> this is actually a picture of Galveston. I have no idea what these people are doing, but it's kind of fun. <laughs> and then the week we moved the furniture in, Hurricane Ike struck. The eye of the hurricane going directly over our house. Galveston once again was devastated. But here you see modern construction practices. They actually used better construction codes on the birdhouse than they did the house itself. <laughs> so this was the famous picture everybody saw on the cover of Newsweek with the house that remained. This house actually did not survive. It was knocked off of its foundation. This was the closest house built to where we built the coastal living house. And so this was our house after the storm. It had survived. It had about, <laughs> had about two and a half feet of sand you know, within the underside of, of the house. And all the landscaping was devastated. But the house was, was virtually intact with the furniture inside. So after that, everything was cleaned up, two months later, we were able to open the house up for guests. By the way, something I wanted to mention about this house is there is no wood in this house, on the exterior of this house. Uh, this is all uh, built out of concrete materials to resist um, ballistic material during a storm. The interiors, you see the light spilling down through the central monitor that will also ventilate the house. So we were successful on that one. So Southern Living came to us and said, we want you to do the same thing, but build it in seven months. So <laughs> uh, we did that as well with the solid masonry house in Central Texas with a schedule that was so fast, we actually had the craftsman, in this case an ironsmith, 
out in the yard while we were under construction, uh, building iron railings and canopies and so on. And this is the finished house. Some work outside of Texas. This is a house in Beverly Hills. Some studies of the garden. And a finished house. Uh, this is a golf club, uh, one of our larger projects uh, that we designed in Central Texas. Uh, this was before the recession, so this was the grand scheme, uh, with a grand scheme for a boardroom up over the entry. Uh, this was the test building. Um, it was a large material sample <laughs> that we built before starting construction. And then the golf course comfort houses. And then the week we poured the slab, uh, the recession hit. Um, so we built the building, uh, but with cutting $10 million out of construction while under construction. It's a small early house, a small, what we call a Sunday house in Central Texas. Very simple, it's all about proportion, composition, and very little detail. A ranch in Central Texas. I was speaking to a student earlier today about the, Ch the Czech influences in Central Texas. This was all based off of the Czech uh, community houses, which were these large octagonal barns that were built. It served as the living room for this large family. A house in San Antonio. And then another DPZ project we were involved with early on was Alice Beach. Uh, this is one of the early houses we designed for a corner lot, uh, really trying to develop the language of what Alice Beach would be. Uh, this was a, an analytique drawn in the office of the impluvium of that house. And then we've built probably about half a dozen houses there, culminating with this house on the main square overlooking the ocean. Uh, this was an interesting house. The fact that we were building out of solid masonry construction uh, rendered in white plaster was really exciting to us. And so I was thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm very uh, uh, enamored with this idea of provincial Roman architecture. In other words, that, that architecture that came out of Rome in the provinces of North Africa and Spain and all its other colonies. Uh, and, and what would uh, this house look like, given that it's solid masonry, uh, if a Roman had landed on the shores of Alice Beach in 2012? So we had a lot of fun with it. So this is it as it was built. Oh. Let's see, next slide. The swimming pool below. And the interior space. Uh, using uh, the white plaster buttresses to reflect light into the space. It's another solid masonry house that we did in Austin, Texas. This was another Palladio Award winner. Uh, high energy efficiency uh, given uh, its construction. The, the library, which had a solid concrete dome that was tiled. Full house. This is a recent project um, that we worked on through most of the recession. Uh, and it was interesting in the fact that we don't do many projects in San Antonio. Most of our work is, is, is well outside. But this project was literally just down the street from our office. Um, and there was this large. John Staub Estate, an Italian villa that was built uh, in 1950. And in the 1980s, a developer came along. And where the main villa stood, the main block of the villa here, he started tearing it down and tore about two thirds of the villa down and subdivided the property. Um, this portion is the only uh, full height portion of the villa that remained. And so when our clients called us, they asked us to 
stitch back the estate again and give it the grandeur and the feeling of the original estate. So what we did was we took what was the original villa, we couldn't build again because the property line now was, was where one wing of the villa used to be, but took the idea of the villa and flipped it back on its service wing to recreate this new axis. And the client bought the houses below. The property line was here. So we added a new facade to the old portion of the house. Uh, and then the houses that were behind were torn down to allow us to recreate the original villa grounds. This is a study of the pool house, or what we call the folly, and the gate entry. Uh, a study by one of our Judson students of the Corinthian column for the back loggia, incorporating the magnolia seed pod for the namesake of the, the project. And then some of the details of the realized construction. The main stairway, which now connected the lower basement level all the way up through the Piano Nobile to the master wing up above. Some of the marble detailing. This is the, the master shower. This is a quick sketch I did showing how we planned on creating this new facade here and stitching the property together um, by allowing this motor court. Um, we actually also flipped, because the, uh, new, the old entry was on the service side, we now have the main entry where the, old where the houses that were torn down, so we now arrived at this point. And then the realization of that. A project we're currently working on in San Francisco. Um, this was an interesting project and a very complicated community. Uh, this was Steve Jobs' well house here uh, for a George Washington Smith house that he had torn down. So there was a lot of, um, uh, the property had been polluted politically, <laughs> so to say, uh, by what Steve Jobs had done on the previous uh, property. Uh, we had the original stable of the estate here, which was a Floyd Brewster building, which was uh, a young draftsman of George Washington Smith. So it wasn't a George Washington Smith building, but we, uh, we fought to save uh, the stable despite the, the fact that the owner wanted to tear it down as well. Um, but then created uh, this estate on the remaining grounds. Uh, this is the guest house compound. Um, again, with Douglas in the audience, uh, Los Catalinas. Uh, this is a project that uh, is underway there now for some apartment units. Uh, that's a, a project in Costa Rica uh, on the uh, Pacific coast there. And uh, because I'm a Notre Dame and Duncan Stroik is here, I had to show my scheme for St. Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> 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 it's cheaper. It's cheaper. <laughs> and then um, this is another project where we were up against uh, Sir Stroik, uh, this uh, uh, mon monastery at St. Gabriel in Ohio, um, which we did not get. Um, this is a small parish in South Texas that we're working on the master plan for. And then currently a seminary, uh, this is just two weeks ago uh, from a charrette with a seminary in North Carolina, uh, initial, initial uh, conceptual sketch from that charrette. And then uh, some of our larger work, uh, an apartment uh, complex in downtown San Antonio and as it was realized, uh, which then gave us the opportunity to do a study for the Hemisphere Park. They're getting ready to tear down the convention center in San Antonio and create a central park for San Antonio, if you will. So we were asked to study the land bank 
or the buildings that would be created to, uh, that the city would lease in order to pay for the maintenance of the park. Uh, so this was a conceptual study to help sell the city council on the project. So um, thank you all for, for coming. Uh, be sure to look up our blog, uh, an architect's journal where, you know, we like to write about all of our adventures in architecture. So thank you all. Absolutely, yeah. Any brave souls out there? <laughs> yes? Okay, so you talked a lot at the beginning about using drawing to understand the place and the site. You showed a lot of examples of people who've done that throughout history. And one of them that you showed was Peru. Mm -hmm. So, at most early modernists, Right. make sure that when we draw something that we don't miss it. Because we can clearly make nice drawings of things and miss what's really going on. Well, I think the point is, is that to draw it, at least you're stopping long enough to get it. Whereas most architects today don't even do that. And you know, the, the point about showing Corbu's drawings, uh, I think correlates to the fact that a lot of the early modern masters, uh, their work was iconic because they did get it. And a lot of the modern work that's being done today um, does not connect because they never stop long enough to understand a place or the people of that place. Um, and drawing has been you know, lost as a tool for doing that. So that's simply all I'm trying to say. Texas Tech. Yes. Well, the point that I tried to make is that you don't need to be a master at sketching. The point is the sketching. The point is the stopping long enough for your, your pencil to make the connection to the paper, to make the connection to your eye, to make the connection to the place, and now all those other sensories that you may have. So it doesn't have to be a beautiful drawing. You just have to be sitting in that place, freezing your fingers off, experiencing it, and because you're drawing it, it will be forever embedded in who you are. You will always remember that moment. So don't get hung up on, on making a masterpiece. I purposely did not show nothing but, well, may not have been any masterpieces, but you know, I wanted to show drawings that were sloppy, drawings that were quick, because that's the point. Anybody else? Thank you all. Appreciate you all for coming.